All right, guys. Well, let's let's get started. Um, we are actually very happy to have Kyrie Bowman here today from SAP, and he's going to talk about SQL Anywhere, but he also works on the HANA team up there. And part of the reason why we're really excited about having him here is we weren't actually sure he was going to show up uh, because he doesn't actually work in Waterloo, where the main you know SAP Sybase office is. Uh, he has this other thing. Actually, let's turn the light down so we can see this better. He has a telepresence robot called Ivan Anywhere. Um, and there's actually a YouTube channel if you're interested in, in seeing what it is. And it's this little robot he has in the Waterloo office that wheels around. And that's how everyone interacts with Ivan. And you've been doing this for how many years now? Eight years. Eight years. So uh, if you're a grad student here, you cannot do this until you finish your classes. After that, you can do whatever you want. So there's, there's Ivan meeting Ivan. OK. Um, so Ivan did his undergrad, master's, and PhD all at the University of Waterloo, which is a really awesome uh, database group there. Uh, he's been at, S he was originally at Sybase, but then SAP bought Sybase since 1992? 93. 93. Um, and now he is the lead architect for SQL Anywhere, which is SAP's embedded database system, which he's going to talk about today. But then he also works along the, the HANA system as well, sort of as, a, as a, an advisory role as well, right? So with that, let's thank uh, Ivan for coming. Uh, thanks, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. Actually, I uh, enjoy this entire series. Uh, I had a chance to watch some of the videos and the slides. Um, Richard Hipp's talk on SQLite was really interesting to me. And I'm glad I got to preview it before doing my own slides. So I'm kind of building on that and augmenting it, knowing that you've probably seen that material. And if you haven't, you can go back and see it uh, on the web. All right. Today I'm talking about uh, what's currently called SAP SQL Anywhere. It's a database management system, and I'm primarily talking about it being used with occasionally connected devices. And occasionally connected means a couple of things, and it means different things to different people. So I'm going to go through what it means to me. Here are some of the use cases where SQL Anywhere um, shows up. One that's important to me, but few others, is the robot that we just saw is running a copy of the SQL Anywhere database. It's just been running for eight years or so now. And it's logging everything like the temperature, the voltage of the battery, the proximity sensors, how well I'm driving. Um, and we use that for some predictive maintenance because the batteries do die. And we want to find out when do we need to order new ones and schedule a period for when I can't use the robot so that they can be replaced. Uh, a much more serious application is where SQL Anywhere is used behind an application that people just download and install on their laptops. So we have some customers that have over 2 million instances of their application. And the customers probably don't know this, but when they install it underneath the covers, SQL Anywhere is installed, and their data is actually being stored within our, our database management system. And there's a number of other cases that fall more into the embedded spectrum that I'm talking about here. So one of them, there's a hospital in Austria uh, SQL Anywhere is running in bathrooms right now. This doesn't sound very exciting to some people, but it's exciting to me. Um, there are sensors in the soap dispensers and various other things in, the, in these bathrooms in the hospital. And SQL Anywhere is running on a small embedded device, a Raspberry Pi. It's about a $30 computer. It's based on Linux ARM. And it's collecting data from these sensors. And it lets the company that manages the bathrooms prove things like, when you push, do you get enough soap with every push? Is there enough milliliters of soap being dispensed? And how well do people comply with the hospital sanitation's requirements? And all of the data is kind of gathered locally. There's even a user interface. Uh, locally, when somebody goes in to clean the bathroom or refill it, they can just type on the screen and, and things happen. Uh, and the data is sent back up to the head office for the company that does the work in order to do things like send out more materials and so on. We're used in some other cases, uh, railway inspectors. Uh, they could be out in the field far away from a network connection. And they're able to enter details where track maintenance is required or further inspection work is needed. 
It's used by utilities like water companies uh, out in the field. They want to monitor, is there any leakage? Uh, I don't know if you know, but a lot of water companies don't get very much water out from all of the amount that they process. And there's a lot of wasted uh, money being spent on uh, processing the water and making it very clean and then just letting it fall into the ground through cracks and leaks in the, in the aqueducts. And this is one of the ways that uh, companies are able to figure out where is water being wasted because they can drive around and use a radio control on the truck to pick up data from a SQL Anywhere database that's running locally at these instances. There's also some very unusual um, installations of SQL Anywhere. I didn't think about the IT needs of an oil rig, but they're actually pretty demanding. An oil rig is really big and expensive. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of maintenance needs. And um, they have a really high speed network on the rig with pretty low latency on the rig. But when you have to connect to the mainland, it's really slow if it's even connected. And when the rig is being moved into position, you may not have a connection at all, but that's a really good time to do maintenance. And it's, it's, a, it's a place where you really want to do the right thing. So you, you want to send somebody up to a special part of the, the rig, and they, they're supposed to replace a part. They're, they better take the part with them, and somebody else better not have done the job, or you're wasting time. So this is a place where SQL Anywhere is running locally. There's a user interface where people are interacting with it. And the data is being sent up back to the, um, the business occasionally, but not on an always connected case. And we even have a case in Alaska where there's a SQL Anywhere installation. It's doing something important. Um, the only way to get to it is by float plane. So if something goes wrong, uh, things are slow, or there's a problem, well, the person that wrote the program can go there and help but they're going to be making a very long trip to get there, and nobody really wants to do that, especially at certain times of the year. SQL Anywhere runs on a wide range of devices. We run on handhelds. I mentioned that we run on Raspberry Pi, uh, so it, the, the Linux ARM. Uh, minimum requirements on uh, Windows XP is 512 megabytes. We run on less on smaller devices, but we also manage up to 512 gigabytes, and we have some customers, which I didn't mention here because it's not really related to embedded, that are running on, on large class machines. Uh, it could be very slow laptop disks up to high speed SSDs or even uh, RAID or SAN. And, and one of the things that's kind of interesting about our product is that you can take a database file on any of these devices and just move it somewhere else and pick it up and use it, make modifications and move it back. So if you're in Lilliput, I think that we would be a, a neutral party because Big Endian and Little Endian, we're happy with either one. Uh, we see a lot of variation in database size. So we have some customers where they have 20 megabytes in their database, but that 20 megabytes is very important to them. Uh, so uh, you know, there's some examples where it goes up to 500 or more gigabytes. Now, obviously, uh, you need different operational um, requirements for a larger database just in terms of backing it up and, and having uh, the infrastructure for it. But we, we have that wide range and we also have a lot of variance in query complexity. Some applications, they're just working with single table selects, inserts, updates, deletes. They're basically using it as a key store. Um, and then we have routinely 15 to 20 uh, tables in the from clause. 50 tables is, is not uncommon, it's not surprising. We've tested uh, beyond 500. There's no hard limit on the number of quantifiers in the from clause. And the schema also very widely varying. Some databases just have tens of tables and not much interesting going on. And others have thousands of tables and 30,000 or more procedures in the database. So I, I just the, what's going to come up is stuff that's probably not very remarkable or novel. I just want to position SQL Anywhere so that we all know what we're talking about at the same time. The SQL Anywhere database uh, can be viewed in different ways. From the operating system point of view, you can think about it as a regular file. Um, there's between 1 and 16 files. Uh, usually that's a good thing. Unfortunately, we had some customers that deleted all the star.log files because they thought they were wasting space for uh, text logs, but that was your forward recovery log and it was gone. And it's hard to help a customer in that situation. Um, from the cache manager point of view, 
these are page addressable uh, files, so you can address uh, using a key of database number, file, and page number. You get to either a 2K or 32K page. At a higher level, you have objects, like tables or indexes. And these are always identified by uh, bit strings. So we have a data type, which is a var bit. And uh, for an example, for a base table, there's a bit string stored in the catalog with a bit on for every uh, page that belongs to the table. And that's really useful for prefetching and scanning the table. Individual pages are envelopes for the, yep? Uh, on your previous slide, you, you, you talked about a single file. Yes. So in the, in the slide you were on, when you say, you mean a directory? So is it actually a directory that you have to move back and forth? Uh, so uh, there are up to 15 different DB spaces that can hold tables. So by default, there's only one database file and one transaction log, and those are the two things that you need to move around. Okay. They you can put them anywhere you want. It doesn't have to go in a special directory. Okay. Um, the reason you might have more than one DB space is if you want to put them on different physical devices because they're big, or if you want to somehow partition the work, uh, you have some stuff that doesn't change very often, you put it in one DB space. OK, okay I'm going to go through this quickly. It's probably things that you've seen before, but just to make sure we're on the same page. Um, if you want to change a row in a table, we take a right lock in our lock table. We remove the index entries that point to the old row. We get a right latch on the page. So nobody else, no other thread is, is uh, working on that page. We can change it around. If the page was clean and cached, it hadn't been changed yet, then we mark it dirty and we write a pre-image to a checkpoint log. And then we modify the row. And we may have to move other rows around if things grow or shrink. And if there's not enough free space on the page, then we use a continuation, a linked list of rows. And that was something that uh, Richard talked about for SQLite. We follow a similar approach where there's no limit on row length. We just use a linked list and keep going. Um, one of the classic examples, some of the really bright guys that created SQL Anywhere in 1992, uh, Dave Yaw and Dave Newdorfer, so they would you know, create the database and set all the values to Yaw, which is four characters, and then change it to Newdorfer, and everything blows up. And uh, depending on how much you pack into the pages originally, you might end up getting these continuations, which give a little bit of a slower performance. After you've modified the row, you add the new index entries, and you add redo log and undo log records. So th that's internally what it looks like, but to the customers, it's always a SQL interface, so standard select, insert, update, delete. And, and the phases of processing, this is similar to the stack that was shown for SQLite. And you take a SQL statement with parameters. Uh, you have a tokenizer, or scan it, parse it. We use a, a version of Yak that was written at Wacom uh, that does the same uh, re-entrant and multi-threading uh, concerns that, that, that were talked about for SQLite. And then we get into semantic transformations, and these are rewrites that modify the parse tree in order to give better performance and get rid of things that, for example, unnecessary distinct. If you have a distinct but you have a primary key in the select list, you can remove that. And there's a number of other um, CNF to DNF conversions that we do to clean up predicates. We're really looking for something that's chargeable that can drive an index scan. A lot of times our users will give us something that looks really ugly with a whole bunch of disjuncts, but if you tease it out, you pull out some conjuncts that you can use for uh, index scan. The portion in pink here is what is uh, done at open time, a pre-optimization step, join enumeration, and post-optimization. And then we get to plan building. And, that, and then um, what we're really building is a volcano style uh, tree of iterators. So these are pre-written C++ classes, um, and they, they stream out row at a time. And our scalar expressions are evaluated using byte machines. Uh, after we've got the plan, we execute it, and then we close it. And this is a, an example of what the, the plan might look like. Uh, there's a combination. This is an eye chart, so I don't expect you to read it. But there's different join types, nested loop, hash join, and merge join. So some of these operators are pipelined, which means that they're positioned on a current row within a pipeline region. And those something that's a little bit different than some other database vendors can be scrolled in both directions. So if you have a fully pipelined plan and you have a cursor, and you might be able to fetch forward and backward um, and, and optionally sensitively see the changes 
um, that are being made by other users. But for this type of plan where we have a work table at the top and an exchange operator to do things in parallel, there's no kind of scrolling or pipelining. Everything is, you can scroll, but you're looking at the results of the work table. You're not seeing live updates from um, your own connection or other connections. All right, just to, to go through the limits, um, we, we're very, we try to be very generous. Uh, so we have up to 13 files per database. Each one can be up to two terabytes. That's really controlled by um, partly some internal data structures, but also the operating systems. Uh, we let you have 45,000 columns per table. And uh, we would even let you have a, a single row that was up to the full file size if you wanted to try it. And uh, the way we look at it is, hey, we don't judge. It's, I don't think it's a good idea to do that, but if you want to try it, it's up to you. And another part of that is that we don't change our data structures to handle the high-end cases better if it's going to hurt our common case. So we let you have 45,000 columns in your table. We do have some n-squared algorithms that work on them. So if you look at making it a hash table or something that has a, a better complexity, the constants are worse at the, at the normal number of columns. So we don't do that. So it's up to you to decide, do I want to pay those order n-squared costs to do this unusual thing in one spot? And our customers came up with this, uh, the Whatcom rule, is that Wacom does things the way that they should be done. So we strive for that. We don't always get there. But uh, there is a corollary that if we do something that's not the way you expected, then you expected it wrong. Uh, so depending on who's saying that, I think. Uh, what, is, what is Wacom? Wacom. Um, yeah, Wacom was the company that originally created SQL Anywhere. It started out as a compiler company. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. And I started on the compiler side, and it, it was Wacom SQL. It was bought by PowerSoft and, and Sybase and then SAP. All right, I'm just, um, just going to go over some of the things that makes uh, SQL Anywhere a little bit different in terms of how it's used and what it delivers. Uh, in an embedded application, the application may want to have complete control over what the user experience looks like. If you're installing um, Intuit QuickBooks, they don't want to have you go out and do a SQL Anywhere install and kind of figure out where to lay out your databases and so on. They just want to manage it, and to the user, it looks like uh, all of it is their application. Um, our product was designed from the beginning for this type of model where it was supposed to fit underneath another application, and even on a mobile device. We talked about deployment diversity from tiny to huge. So we have a small footprint that we can fit in those small cases, Raspberry Pi or in phones, but we can also scale up to the very high, uh, end, high end machines as well. Developers with a range of database experience. So we have some customers that have multiple PhD graduates from Stanford or other places and they really know what they're talking about and what they want from our product. And at the other end, we have customers that don't have any formal computer science background, um, and they, they're able to use our product in a way that meets their needs. And, and the way that we try to deal with this is by making it easy to embed, administer, and, and support. And that's really critical. Applications can last for decades. So if you have a working database application uh, written 20 years ago, it may still be meeting your needs today, and you don't want to pay the price to rewrite it. And the way we've tried to help with that is that we always read older database files, and we broke that one time. And, and it was in uh, 2006, after the first release in 1992, we read all of the older versions up to 2006, and finally we had a, a flag day and said, okay, you have to unload, reload into the new format. But until then, you could uh, take an old database, run it in newer software, go back and run it in older software. So what, what changed 2006 and made you break this and say you had to give it up? We, there were some physical store changes that we really wanted to get in. So one of the examples, I mentioned that bitmap that shows you which pages belong to a table. Before we put that in, there was a previous and next point on each table page didn't make it easy to do prefetching, and there was some concurrency issues. 
Um, and, and there was a few other things that had kind of built up that we really wanted to get in there. Um, and we decided it was worth it. Our customers still haven't decided if, if it was worth it. Uh, failures happen. Failures happen a lot because you're running on commodity hardware out in the field with customers that aren't really thinking about databases but getting their job done. People are running a database and they shut the lid on their laptop and it goes to sleep and it comes back and it's a different day. Or um, they drop their phone and, uh, and things crash. Um, batteries run out. So we, we deal with this. As, uh, w one of the common issues is, is strange hardware failures. So you get um, a bad bit in memory or you get some other thing that happens when you're writing it out to disk. Things just didn't get there the way that they were supposed to. We, we do a lot to try to, to detect problems by using check, checksums. We have a lot of redundancy so that if we get into a salvage situation where a um, customer doesn't have a good backup and recovery plan and they're not following best practices, we can still uh, get their data back for them. We always have durable commits. So we always run um, that commits are, are durable. Uh, some of our customers have said to us, oh, we don't care if we lose the last few transactions. Um, in my experience, people feel that way during development, but not during disaster when they've lost the last few transactions and are trying to figure out what happened. So we, we don't give you the option of not making it durable. Single connection case is important in our use case. So I talked to Tamarazu at the University of Waterloo about a particular case where you know, there's just not enough work for the database to do. And he said, well, just get more users and assign it to the database. I, I can't get more users. They're a scarce resource. You know, so there's, my machine is able to do more work, but it's kind of like a lazy high school student. You know, it does the thing that somebody came in to ask it for, and then it goes to sleep. And I'd rather have it be kind of an eager um, university grad, you know, go out, sweep the floor, get some stock, and pull it up, and get it to do things that are going to make things work better. There's a number of key features. I'm going to talk about some of these in more detail, but I'll skip over them. Um, just a couple that I wanted to highlight. I talked about portable database files. Uh, concurrency control are based on the standard uh, three isolation levels. We also have snapshot isolation. Uh, something that's a little different for us is that we have different regions of trust. In an embedded space, you've got the application developer who owns the application code and logic and wants to have some control. You've got the data owner. They are the user that actually owns the data. And then you've got SQL Anywhere. Um, and we own, the, you know, of course, the source code. So we offer database and, and table encryption and wire protocol encryption but also some un, um, different things like um, obfuscated procedure and function text. So that uh, if you're an application developer and you're concerned about your end users you know, kind of going in and changing things on you without paying you to customize it, um, you can use some of these features. Rich SQL language support. We have many of the features of the SQL 2015 core and beyond, but we can't claim conformance at this time due to a few issues. Um, and pretty full data type support. We've got spatial data, XML generation and consumption, and JSON uh, row and array types uh, in procedures, but not stored persistently. Stored logic uh, triggers procedures and functions, which are either written in, in this Watcom SQL dialect, uh, which is close to the 1992 persistent stored modules. Um, they can also be written in native or uh, external environments. And we also have some interesting thing here where you can have a procedure that makes a call to a web uh, site. So you could have a geotagging uh, application where you've got an address and you want to turn it into lat long. So you can make a call out to a web server to do that for you. We also have remote data access to ODBC data sources or files on the file system. Something that's really weird um, integrated HTTP server. I, I wrote a, a simple web server as an example for our compiler group uh, in 1995, and Dave Yaw, on an airplane flight, converted it into something in the, in the database engine. And I thought this was kind of an interesting or weird thing that nobody would want to use, but it's actually kind of interesting because you have this Raspberry Pi running SQL anywhere and you want to use your interface. What are you going to hit to do that? 
um, we can serve up directly from the database server a web uh, web application, and you can you know read the the strings. You can use blobs to store images and so on. So it's a little bit of a a different environment in the embedded case where it really does make sense to do things that you might not think of. We, we use a significant difference from SQLite is we use logical logging instead of physiological logging. Uh, the transaction log has individual insert updates and deletes in the DDL statements. One of the things this gives us is redundancy. So if you have your forward recovery log and uh, a backup, you can manually decode the log and figure out what to do. So some user comes to you and says, oh, I don't know, yesterday I had the shift key on and everything went wrong and I put in the wrong values. You can go through and find out exactly what changes that user made and correct them. Uh, that, that's a strange salvage situation, but um, logical logging enables a number of other things like our scale-out high availability and read-only scale-out is done through log shipping. Um, it also gives us some durability to uh, two failure modes that we've seen. One is uh, memory error, where you, know, you read a page into the database, you change a few bits, and you write it out, and everything else gets garbled. And uh, if you did physiological logging, you'd write out that bad new page to two spots, and then you're, you're cooked. You can't get back. Um, but we have a distinct copy, a different representation that is not as likely to be affected by that problem. This also lets you recover to a specified point in time. So somebody accidentally truncates a table, and, and you want to recover to the point just before that, you, you can do that with our logging format. In addition to the SQL Anywhere database server, we've got something called MobileLink. Uh, it's an important piece of technology that replicates data from SQL Anywhere to a back-end database running, for example, in a data center. And this could be, <coughs> this could be HANA, uh, Sybase ASE, Oracle, or, or the other uh, vendors. SQL Anywhere or Ultralight has to be running on the remote site. We enable some of the MobileLink technology through our, our logging and running scripts within the database. Ultralight is another database server that's a little bit closer to C uh, SQLite. It's an in-process uh, database server, and it's targeted at the most resource-constrained platforms. SQL Anywhere will run on a phone, it'll run on a Raspberry Pi, but it needs you know, some number of megabytes to run. This can go even smaller and take up less, less space. Okay, so far that was just material to get us to the same uh, point, and now I'm getting to what I think is the interesting part. Um, there's a number of query optimization challenges that show up in our space that I don't think are the same in other database uh, use cases. And, and the real person to talk to about this is Anisora Nika. She has taken over the optimization for SQL Anywhere and has a large number of papers. I referenced some of them in the slides. Uh, there really is no expert available at most installations to tune the database to the workload. So there's nobody Nobody to manage it other than the software. The workload that we see is usually a mix of cheap OLTP and expensive OLAP queries at the same time from different connections. And, and often, we don't see a lot of correlation between query complexity and execution cost, so long as you have a decent plan. And the challenge for the optimizer is that um, the query as presented has many, many very expensive plans and a few good ones. And if you spend a lot of time finding those good ones, you've spent more than the query could have uh, done. So it's really important to get quickly to a good plan for even 500 or more quantifiers. And I had a paper with Glenn Pauly in 2000 about this um, that talked about how we were able to do that even in memory-constrained environments. The machine configurations are diverse, and they change at runtime, so our costing has to take that into effect. And the data characteristics are, are wildly different between installations. So you could have a shrink-wrapped application, and many, many of your customers are individuals just working with a small amount of data. And then a few customers have a huge installation, and you want to have a single database schema that works in both of those spaces. And the design choice that we have in SQL Anywhere is to optimize every open. 
So that was from the beginning, we would optimize at open time. Optimizing at open time, this is another of the significant differences I noted from the SQLite talk, is that um, Richard talked about a way that you could basically prevent plan changes when you deploy your application. And um, we've, we've selected a different part of the space. And some of the things that we see is that you can use the most precise cardinality estimates. You're looking at the parameter values that are coming in for your query. You're looking at the current estimates of the table size and skew. And we even estimate how much of the table or index is currently in cache. We have accurate estimates of how many other requests are running right now. Unfortunately, there's a couple of downsides to this approach. Uh, the optimization cost can be high, and it's not amortized over multiple requests. And another one is what we affectionately call the dancing optimizer or the plan of the month club, which is that things look good during development and most of the time, and then you get a bad plan and things take a long time. And this is a problem that our customers don't like. It doesn't happen very often. Uh, but it is a downside. There's a few things that we do to... Is, is there anything about the query... Uh, is there any features about a query that would cause it to ping? Like, is it above 10, 10, 10 joins, it's just it ping-pongs back and forth? Or is, there, is there any sort of one thing you can say that causes your optimizer to, to end up picking the wrong thing more, more often? Uh, you, usually, uh, we've seen this show up when we don't really have a good idea what your query is trying to do. So you've got some uh, search conditions in your where clause that uh, they're not your typical uh, sargeable okay. on indexed columns, but it's some kind of function is equal to some other function. And we're kind of guessing at selectivity. So when you get enough guesses in there, often we will be very consistent. But then if you match it with, a, like, if you're just on the cusp of one plan or another, uh, and I have a slide that I think uh, touches on it a bit more. So th this is related to a problem we have with individually cheap requests. What's wrong with cheap requests? They're great. They're cheap. Um, this is the way I like to think about requests. You, you have some think time at the client. You send your request. You do a little bit of work at the beginning. You execute for a while. You do one or two IOs, and you're done. And uh, the optimizer can reduce the execution time, and give you better performance. But in, in the cheap request case, you're spending a lot of this blue overhead building up data structures, doing your optimize on open, and they're a very small amount on execute. So it, I mean, if you look at where the server time goes for data that's in cache for a primary key lookup, um, your fetch time might be something like 26 microseconds, but your total overhead is sort of on the order of uh, 80 microseconds or so. If you did even one I.O., even on SSDs, this would be completely dwarfed by the execution costs. Um, but what it means is that if we make an improvement to our processing that will speed up an expensive query from 10 seconds to 5 seconds, which is great, it may add a couple of microseconds to open time to just consider other options. And that shows up as a relative difference here. Uh, this is a topic I looked at in my thesis with, with Ken Salem in 2005. And, and we did this experiment with a, an in list with multiple different numbers of elements. And if you look at the slope, that gives you an approximation of what's the cost to do one index probe in memory. And if you look over here in this bar chart, the yellow is the server cost, and the blue is the client cost. This little dotted line way down here is the cost to do a single index probe, which is very small compared to the overhead. And we have applications that are written that are basically doing a client-side join. So they open up a query. They pull down a bunch of rows. For each row, they're going to do a primary key lookup. They're paying that overhead over and over and over again. So the approach that, that we proposed is, uh, to detect certain patterns and to uh, uh, prefetch the results at the server and reduce the number of fine-grained requests that are sent. We haven't actually managed to transition all of that into the server. There's a number of 
it, it's great theoretically. It'll get you a, a thesis, but uh, we're not so sure about giving it to customers yet. This we actually have gotten partway there. Uh, parametric plan caching is work that uh, Gunesh Aluk and Dave Tahan and I did. We had a paper in 2012. So what this says is, okay, we have always optimized at open time. We have the values of parameters. We're different from other databases that make some generic assumptions about what the parameter values might be. Um, how do we get the benefit that they have of amortizing optimization cost across multiple opens without giving up this nice feature that we're picking the right plan? And here, this is a plan space diagram. It's the two, two predicates looking at the selectivity uh, of S1 and S2. And, and the plan space is complicated. It's got these little islands. There's like a bunch of different plans and different costs. And maybe some of those differences actually aren't that important, but a different plan is being picked um, because there's some special case that the optimizer is able to exploit or it's getting fooled. Um, well, the idea that, uh, that we talked about, and Dave Tahan and I came up with the analogy, is that you're really looking at counting cards in blackjack, where there is a small upside. And if you do everything right, you're going to get the benefit of cutting down that optimizer overhead. But if you are not as good as you think you are, there's a huge downside that the plan you picked is worse by even one I.O. One I.O. is a couple of milliseconds, and you're looking at shaving off uh, tens or twenties of microseconds. Um, so what Ganesh said is, okay, let's look at the incoming, let's monitor what the optimizer is doing. Look at the incoming uh, parameter selectivity and look at the plans it picks. And we're going to model the optimizer statistically using this locality sensitive hashing. And we're going to predict that the optimizer would choose a particular plan within certain regions of the space. And um, you know, if we can't tell with good enough certainty, we'll just go to the optimizer and let it figure it out. And, and this actually works pretty well at, at picking good plans. It, it still has the occasional catastrophic failure where you lose all your money and you go home in shame. All right, um, moving on to access methods. Um, so obviously, full table scan, I mentioned that we have a bitmap and we can prefetch the pages that are in the table because we, we have a list of all of them. We also have B tree indexes. Something that's a little bit different is that we don't have any bounds on the length of our keys and our, our B trees. Um, we don't judge. So they don't have to fit into a page. Uh, you could have keys that are multiple two gigabyte strings. Uh, I don't think that's a good idea, but we let you do it. The keys are binary uh, comparable. We, we make a hash that, of 255 bytes of the prefix because almost all of our customers will have keys that fit that size. And then we use a compact uh, B tree that's based on a Patricia tree internally within each node. And it lets you um, traverse the tree without comparing the entire key. Um, there's more details in the paper if you're interested. The, the choice between a sequential scan and an index scan is one of the key decisions um, that the optimizer has to make. And it depends on things like how much of the data is already in memory and how much of it is going to have to go through uh, disk. And for the disks that it's on, what's the penalty for random I.O. versus sequential I.O.? And uh, Yi Ken was a, a student working with Ken Salem and Anil Goal, one of my colleagues in Waterloo. And, and they talked about a number of the trade-offs that are important when you're thinking about choosing between these two cases. But um, something that's interesting that may not come up in other database systems as much is that when you have a single connection, you can really max out the resources that you give it. And uh, Pedram Godznia is a PhD. Uh, candidate at Waterloo. He was working with me as an intern, and he looked at uh, parallel aware query optimization. So here, the observation is, um, if you're doing an index scan with this yellow line and you're just doing one prefetch, then you get a certain level of performance. But if you put 32 requests um, to the OS at a time through prefetching, you can get much better performance. 
And the way that we model this is to look at a uh, disk transfer time model, uh, which, which is based on Anil's work uh, from his, his PhD thesis on object databases. But, but Pedram took it to, a, uh, to looking at the prefetch depth. So if you look at only a single thread uh, for SSD and hard drives, the band size on the bottom is how many pages apart are the pages that you're reading. So if the band size is one, the pages are adjacent. So you're doing a sequential scan. Um, if they're very far apart, you're doing a random read of the entire table. If you look at the SSDs, there's not a very big impact for random I.O. There's a little bit probably because of some uh, controller issues. But when you look at hard drives, there's a really significant impact to the uh, random I.O. And the DTT abstracts a whole bunch of things like head movement and waiting for rotational latency and so on. When you look at parallelism, when you're willing to put lots of prefetch requests out, you get a huge benefit for SSDs, especially when you move out to higher uh, band sizes. But when you do it on hard drives, you don't get as much of a benefit. So it's important to know what your hard drive what your storage um, technology is. And Pedram's idea, there's two approaches. One, the user can calibrate the devices that they're working with. And the other one is, if you haven't done that, at startup, he does a few probing requests and figures out, this probably looks like it's an SSD, this looks like it's a hard drive. All right, uh, moving on to a slightly different topic, load balancing. Um, SQL Anywhere does support running multiple databases on a single machine. So this could either be in a VM or it could be on a single server that's running databases that are for unrelated customers. So we have um, one customer that stores databases for, they're, they're actually for competitors. Uh, the end users are competitors. And uh, by consolidating it onto a single server, they're saving um, in terms of overhead, of how much hardware they need to support the workload, which might be fairly light. You still need to predict, is it going to make sense to put these workloads together? And one of the things we observed, um, you can't always predict what a workload is going to do in a different situation, especially if it has self-adaptive features. So you could look at a workload and say, wow, this thing's doing a huge amount of I.O. It's just uh, keeping the disk saturated, so I better not put it together with anything else. You put it on a different machine or with different concurrent requests, and it can switch to a much lower I.O. Uh, policy. So it might switch from an index scan, because it was cheap on that other system, to a sequential scan, which is doing less I.O., uh, but still giving acceptable performance to the customer. So uh, in, in this work, we looked at um, adaptive invariant workload properties. So we tried to look at properties like how many rows of data are being changed, uh, how many rows are being matched by select statements. And, and these are not going to be affected by optimization plans. There's one idea that we haven't fully explored, which is to um, use the power of the optimizer against it. And, uh, get the optimizer to run in a, a what-if mode and try to tell us what would happen in a, a proposed configuration of multiple workloads. And that's, that's something that we're continuing to look at. All right, uh, if I look at cardinality estimation, cardinality estimation is one of the key features of optimization to figure out uh, index scan or sequential scan. What's the size of this intermediate result? How many rows will be materialized? We have self-tuning histograms, uh, base tables and temp tables. The statistics are updated on the fly automatically. We build join histograms temporarily just for intermediate results and then we get rid of them. Um, and the server maintains persistent index statistics in real time. So. Uh, some databases, they have clustered indexes and non-clustered, and it's binary. So if it's clustered, you know that all of the leaf pages uh, are in the same order as the rows of the table, and you may even use a B plus tree, so it's stored right there. 
Um, in our case, it's kind of uh, proximate. So we look at how far apart are the keys and, and what's the band size? What's the average number of transitions that you're going to see? And, and this, um, we see a lot of cases where indexes are kind of clustered, but not 100%, and they're not declared as clustered, but they give the performance characteristics of a clustered index. And we, so by tracking a few things, we're able to do a good job of uh, cost estimation. Our, our column histograms, um, they have a combination of range buckets and singletons. The singletons are used for the most frequent individual values, and they're updated by the results of predicate evaluation. So they really tune themselves to what are the, um, the search conditions, the predicates in your query, in your workload. So they try to give accurate answers for those, and, and the goal is not to match the data distribution of, of your rows. The goal is to answer accurately the queries from the optimizer for your workload. So it, it's, um, it's easy to get misled and say, well, this is a bad histogram because it doesn't match the data. That's not important. What's important is for the queries that you are presenting, do you make good choices? So we, we have self-healing statistics. We monitor the quality of the estimates that, that they are giving. Uh, we characterize them as poor, and then we heal them or bad, in which case we drop them and rebuild them through piggybacking. So if we, if we find out that we're going to run a plan that's doing a sequential scan over a table and going to see all the data, it's an opportunity to recreate the uh, statistics that time. So we have a lot of adaptive algorithms in the, in the database. So one of them is the buffer pool size. You don't have to pick how, how big is your cache going to be. By default, it adapts based on the size of your database file, um, what's your workload, and what else is going on in the operating system. So we view this as being a good corporate citizen. You're running on a database on a laptop for some shrink wrap application, and then somebody starts up um, their email program, and the, and the pressure on the operating system increases. Well, we can shrink our memory consumption, uh, especially if we don't think it's going to affect performance very much. Another, a few more things that are different. The database restarts probably more often in our cases because, you know, especially in the single user cases, you start up the application, the database starts up, you shut down the application, the database shuts down. Um, we have something called startup warming. It keeps track of the page references during the startup period and it brings them in. A um, little bit of an issue there with the optimizer. So, an issue with self-adapting algorithms is that they may interact with each other. The optimizer is looking at what's currently in cache. The cache warmer has brought in some stuff. And the optimizer says, hey, I'm going to change my plan. So now you've done warming based on plan A. The optimizer says, well, the state's different. I'm going to choose plan B. So you, now you record a different trace for plan B. And then you get into this cycle where the warming and the optimizer continuously change between different alternatives. And, and there's actually some heated discussions in the hallways between the uh, cache warming group and the optimizer group about what should happen here. Um, what's currently happening is the cache warming lies to the optimizer and says the data is not in cache yet. You have to pretend and pick a plan that, that it doesn't exist. But, but the general topic is that adaptive algorithms are good, but interactions are hard to predict. So are you, are you saying that adaptive algorithms, is it? Um, revisited periodically, so like, you know, I'm on the desktop or something. Yep. The database starts up with the machine moves, but then I open my 2,000 browser tabs. So at some point in the future, does that get adjusted back? Yeah, so for the, the cache warming case that I'm talking about, by default, uh, it records every startup and then uses it the next time. Um, so one of the things we've talked about is having some hysteresis or history so that it's a weighted average of previous behaviors. Okay. Um, but generally, with our adaptive algorithms, they're looking at what's happening right now or, or recently, as opposed to longer term, both because it's easier to look at what's happening right now and also because stuff may have changed dramatically from the past. We have a different type of cache warming for steady state. So you recognize that your application has loaded up all of its data, and you say, OK, that's good. And then um, the next time you start up, 
in the background, those pages can be loaded uh, before you get to queries that ask for them. So, you, you know, we commonly get these users that say, well, you know, I've been running the system for days and everything is good, but I, I just need to shut down to do this thing. And if I bring it back up, I know that things are going to go weird for a while because, you know, the plans are going to change and you'll be doing I.O. that users aren't used to seeing. Um, so this is a way to deal with that, that you can get back to that no and good hot state. Every table and index keeps track of how many pages are currently in cache. And the cost model estimates how many disk reads are going to be used uh, based on that. All right, I'm going to quickly go over some material. We dynamically adjust our multi-programming level, um, the number of threads that you have available. Uh, you might think more is better. Well, it depends what your workload is doing. And one of the cases we see is where um, through application design or other reasons you can get a convoy forming where you have one resource and all of the connections need to hit it. And if you add more workers, you're increasing the length of the convoy and the amount of time that the overhead that's being spent for every worker trying to do its work increases. So increasing the number of workers can be bad. Um, it can also be good if you're allowing more things to work. Uh, so Muhammad Abu Zur and Ken Salem wrote a paper on how to do this as part of Muhammad's uh, master's thesis. We have a number of adaptive query processing methods. Um, we will choose a different access plan locally at execution time. If you have a hash join and we find out that the build side was a lot smaller than we thought, we're going to switch to a nested loop join on the right hand side. Um, we will switch to a low memory strategy. If you had a group by hash operator and we find out that we just don't have the memory we were expecting, um, it can stop and use something else which is not as fast but will work. Uh, we use parallelism within the query plan but we adapt to what else is going on. So are yep. all of these things just heuristics to say like turn this feature on and off? There's all these like, heuristics you're checking to see this is something that's wrong, we switch to this other thing. Go back and back. There's no sort of high level thing that's making these decisions sort of case by case basis. Yeah, I mean, it, it's done locally on a cost basis with information from the optimizer. So the op for the, this uh, hash join twisting to nested loop, for example, the optimizer says, I think hash join's good here, but if you see less than this number of rows, switch to nested loop join. A and we do it on a very local basis instead of having, uh, I think if you look at a uh, graphs paper, the choose plan operator uh, was kind of a more generic way to, to do that. So we've, we've talked about that in robust query processing. Um, we, we do... The triggers are like almost like application specific. We, like w what, what we've got in the product are things where we can be sure that we've recognized that there's a problem and we can do something that we're sure is not going to make it worse. And, and that's just a lot of abundance of caution and, and not making things kind of go in strange circles. Um, but uh, we, we've talked about um, and these, all of these kinds of interesting ideas like running two subplans in parallel, especially if you know that you have some uncertainty about selectivity and um, doing some sampling locally before you find things out or re-optimizing. Uh, all of that sounds very interesting, but it, it can lead to a very unpredictable experience for the users and, and we haven't gone there. And do you maintain any history about decisions you make internally where I thought I was going to do this and then it turned out to be wrong so I have to switch back? We do for plan caching right now. So we, ha we have a blacklist uh, that says I thought that this was a really good candidate for plan caching and it wasn't. So um, our original version of plan caching, the first 10 executions it looked at is the plan always the same? Oh, that's good. On the 11th, I'm going to do what the other vendors do and just pick a plan that doesn't look at the current configuration. And um, if it wasn't the same, we'd say, oh, that wasn't good. But we'd execute it anyway. And um, sometimes that 11th plan could be quite poor. If there was especially some special structure of the query, if you had a, a like condition with a non-wildcard prefix, you could use an index scan um, and if you optimize without using the parameter values, you have to go for a sequential scan instead. So now we re-optimize, so we go back to the optimizer, and we also put some history in memory. It's not persisted at this time. So that's my next question. Yeah. So if you restart the database system, 
it, everything goes back to scratch. Um, so we've talked about having a, a persistent query information um, that knows about all the queries that have been executed and, and different conditions, but we haven't, haven't gone there yet. And in practice, do you find that like the shops where they don't have any data section at all, that are okay with this? Yep. The one with, I, I present the Stanford PhDs, the CMU PhDs. Yes, uh, I, I, I didn't actually meet CMU, but I'm sure they're there. <laughs> So, and uh, those guys, do they say, no, no, we know what we're doing, turn, the, turn all the scrap off? So, um, this may make you happy. They knew a lot about what they were doing that didn't match well with what worked. Uh, so, the, uh, uh, in, in practice, many of the things that they wanted us to do made things worse. So, you know, we were able to show that through experimentation. But um, in terms of turning things off, yes, there. Our approach is uh, good defaults, no knobs where we can be sure that you don't need to change things, and then a, a knob that you can turn it in different ways. So you can turn off plan caching. Um, there's no, our product does not offer a way to say use this plan, uh, but you can say I want to use this index and a few other hints. Um, so there, there are some controls there, but we're not aiming at somebody that says I'm a DBA and I want control of how everything works. Uh, we, we don't let you um, have that level of control. Yeah. Uh, this is actually the end of my, I have some other material here, but this is the end. Um, so I'd be happy to take any questions. We have scalar expressions, um, you know, x is equal to y plus 5. Uh, originally, in 1992, that was a tree of expressions evaluated through recursive descent. And there were flags that indicated, have we previously evaluated this y plus 5? And we only need to evaluate it when y is changed. Uh, so in version 10, uh, this was one of the changes when the database file format changed. Um, we take that tree and we compile it down to bytecode so that we figure out where should we evaluate the y plus 5, which may be eagerly before it's needed, and then we retain the, retain the value. Um, but it's our own byte machine. It's not a Java byte machine or, or LLVM. So um, if we did it a little bit later, LLVM would have been a great uh, choice probably. But. It, it's also stack based and probably uh, three address would have been better. So it was really interesting to hear Richard uh, mention that about SQLite that uh, a lot of people start with stack machines, which we did. Uh, I blame my co-op student. Uh, but <laughs> it, it works well enough, but uh, our byte machine is not Turing complete and doesn't have recursion, so a three address machine would better meet the needs. You don't need to have stack frames and so on. Uh, there's a, a developer edition that you can use for academic use, so if you want to download it and try it out. Um, we have the best price performance on TPCC uh, for databases that fit within that, that realm, so we're good for OLTP. We don't have published results for OLAP-style workloads, but we feel we do pretty well there. Not, not as good as the data warehouses, but good. Um, so. Can you say roughly, like, percentage-wise, what percentage of customers are running on like cell phones versus laptops versus rack servers? I think that, uh, I mean, the curve is really steep. That uh, laptops and desktops dominate. Um, there are lots of instances on cell phones that are used. Uh, so numerically, they might be close to the laptops, but they are um, not used for very long, I, I guess. And, and then there are a few that, um, th there, there's a number of customers that may have an application that they want to run on different spots, and there's some that just want to use us on high-end machines because they, they like the way that we do things. Um, so, so we do have a range. And is it, is it like a single code base? Like, I mean, obviously, like, if it's ARM, do this, and if it's Intel, do that. 
but the overall the architecture is exactly the same across, across all devices. Yeah, and, and that's something that's important is that um, it's surprising, or it was surprising to me, that on a handheld, our customers are using all of our features, materialized views and spatial and text indexes. And you know, we thought about making a low-end version, especially you know back in the days of CE, our executable size was 1.5 meg, and you know that was kind of big for devices at that time. And some other vendors were really stripping stuff out to kind of fit into there. And we probably could have saved a third of our executable size, uh, but we left it in. Um, to be honest, it was just easier than than taking it out and retesting it. And, and customers really found that materialized views and, and all those features were what they wanted. They didn't want a stripped down version, uh, e even if it was a bit slower to use some of the features to have them there. It was good. Next week, we're having Lauren Fruits from Oracle to talk about ProfitDB, and then I'll be at the end of the embedded database lecture series. Plus, I got it.